Alright guys, chapter 29, From Isolation to Global War, namely the beginning of World War II. Uh, the United States is still reeling from the Depression, right? FDR is in power, and fascism is on the rise in Europe. Following World War I, uh, the United States and its population were disillusioned with European affairs, uh, there was an indifference towards them, realized that coming out of that, uh, they were doing the best they could to stay away from European involvement. They wanted to be neutral, they wanted to be isolated, as it says, you know, in the title, um, and the tone was really kind of set from, from post-World War I, all right? Think about the ideas of nativism, where they were trying to keep out, uh, immigrants, the whole Red Scare thing with the, the anarchists and all these, you know, the communists and these people from... Europe trying to bring those ideas to the United States and how they were all freaking out about that. And then lastly, look at, uh, economically, tariffs. How they used tariffs to also put a wall between them and European investment uh, or goods or however you want to look at it. Now, at the same time, the United States couldn't completely cut itself off. It had to worry about Europe because it had business interests in other places. Uh, not just Europe. Say it wanted to get into the market in China, for example. Um, and so, even though it was isolated and it didn't want to be part of the League of Nations, uh, there were also times where it would work with the League of Nations. Um, it partnered with them with certain mandates and certain things uh, to, to make places um, open for business, basically. Now, war debt and reparations. Uh, the war debt issue... Uh, made people even want to be more isolationist because, remember, we tried to say, hey, 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 we can't stick to Germany quite like that, but the other powers were, you know, doing the best they can to be, to be punitive following World War I. Also, there was a growing anti-American sentiment across Europe during this time period due to the uh, banking and all that sort of stuff and staying out of the league and so forth. So, <clears throat> there's an animosity there. Also, what happens is, when it came time to pay the war debts that the other countries owed us for the Allies or, or whoever for supplying war material and so forth, um, we saw it as a matter of principle, just like, hey, you pay your debts, that kind of idea. The Europeans, on the other hand, were like, hey, we'll pay you back when the Germans pay us back. And so, the German economy was struggling as it was, and then it was brought to its knees by these reparation payments. And there were several times where bankers were called in and formed a reparations committee to sort of keep it from, from dying, you know. And there's a period of time uh, called where Germany is under what they refer to as the Weimar Republic, and there's hyperinflation, and there's some very classic pictures, bring it to my attention in class and I'll show them to you, of people shoveling money into furnaces and shoveling it into the gutter uh, because there was really no value for it. And uh, some of the better pictures are, uh, there's huge stacks of it uh, and they're made into bricks or blocks or whatever for, to or for kids, toys for kids to play with. Now, uh, in 1931, President Herbert Hoover is going to negotiate a moratorium on the debt for Germany and other places, all right? So that way they don't have to default on their loan, all right? But by 1932, most of the European countries default on their loan, all right? Uh, their loans, excuse me. And this, the reason this is bad is it because it is, it'll devalue currency over a time. Uh, if your country can't do it, it'll lower its rating. Uh, a while back, the U.S. got a lower credit rating or bond rating or whatever it was uh, because of the whole issue going on with the money we owed, so forth. And so this was kind of like that back in the 30s, all right? And the Congress actually gets so annoyed by it, they passed the Johnson Debt Default Act, which basically means we can't trade or loan money to, we can't loan money to, we can still trade, I guess, uh, with the countries that defaulted on their loans. Now, also coming out of World War I, there were these attempts at disarmament. Okay, realize, yet again, people were disillusioned with war, the brutality of it, um, and so lessening all the militarism, as we talked about uh from World War One and the whole main issue that we talked about, um, they try to limit the number of arms in the world. All right, so the U.S., as it says in your book, had no intention of keeping a large standing army. All right, you'll see the size of the army swell and shrink, as I've mentioned before, 
with wars, all right? So they decreased the size of their army. But the U.S. and Britain did have large navies at the time, and we didn't really hope to shrink our navy, but we will make deals to shrink it significantly, all right? But both the United States and Britain, with the strongest navies, were leery of the empire of Japan, all right? During World War I, Japan had seized German land uh, in parts of China, and they, the United States really had to uh, walk a fine line with them because they weren't really happy with what Japan was doing during World War I, but they needed to keep them as an ally. So they signed this ambiguous treaty to keep them in the war, um, but afterwards, they really cut ties with them. They don't want to deal with them, all right? Now, during this period, you're going to get the Five Powers Treaty, which will reduce the size of navies um, and effectively partition the world amongst major naval powers like the United States, Britain, and Japan. Also, you're going to get during this time period the Four Powers Treaty, which was a respect to one another's possessions in the Pacific, all right? Uh, and then eventually the Nine Powers Treaty, which, like Hay back in 1899 had asked for, is an open door trading policy in China. Also, probably one of the bigger ones and more uh, more sort of special type things here is going to be the uh, Kellogg Brand Pack. Now, if you've been watching Men Who Made America, you realize that Kellogg was the attorney that was prosecuting Rockefeller. But outside of that, the Kellogg Brand Pack was this pack that the idea was trying to abolish uh, war and everything, which I know sounds wild, but... Uh, that was really the sentiment at the time. They really wanted to stay out of these world wars and all this sort of stuff. So this never uh, never go to war contract will be signed with the French. That's basically what the Kellogg Brand Pack is. And so the Pact of Paris, which is also part of it, has 62 nations sign up um, to stay out of wars. And you can see down here in the uh, in this map the different places. Uh, that signed it. So dark green were the original ones, light green was the ones that came on, and then the parts of blue were then uh, holdings of those other places. You can see really the interesting thing is uh, how South America and Latin America really kind of stayed out of it, which I find interesting. Um, now, uh, there were like out clauses in this for self-defense, and also we said, hey, hey, the Monroe Doctrine is pretty important, and we need to be able to meddle in other countries in our side of the world's affairs. So, <clears throat> with those stipulations kind of as a, you know, get-out-of-jail-free card for us, uh, we all signed this pact. Now, there's a quote in your uh, textbook that says, this worthless but perfectly harmless peace treaty... Uh, was worth signing, uh, then confusing the minds of many people who think that peace may be secured by polite professions and neighborly and brotherly love. So, you know, politicians at the time signing this were not really uh, blind to the fact that, you know, signing a piece of paper isn't going to keep people out of war. Now, also, you had the good neighbor policy during this time period. You can see that down here in these uh, pictures. I, I think this one is on the right here is particularly interesting because Walt Disney creates a uh, character, the, uh, I forget the name of the little toucan bird there, but to yet again help with American foreign policy. He will also create a lot of things during the war uh, to drum up support, and we'll look at those in class. Now, the good neighbor policy, all right, um, in Latin America, we were not super popular, all right, but we began to treat Latin American, Latin American countries a little bit more like they should be treated. The U.S. is going to leave the Dominican after eight years, and eventually leave Nicaragua the following year, but then return to help, yet again, put down rebellions or so forth. 1933, uh, Hoover is going to pr improve the U.S. image by saying the Monroe Doctrine, or actually leaking a, a bull, uh, leaking a memo or something like that, that said, you know, it doesn't call for outright intervention in cities, or countries, excuse me. And so these European, or not European, Latin countries are going to appreciate that. And eventually FDR takes it to the next level, and he says... Likewise, is going to embrace the good neighbor policy, and no country could intervene in, in one another's affairs, all right? putting us all on equal footing. Now, the idea there yet again is to uh, make friends and make allies out of these Latin American and Caribbean countries. All right, hopefully you watched the first one, but throughout the notes you'll notice clips on YouTube from Walter Cronkite's uh, 
Seeds of War series, uh, and they're really, really good for learning this material. They go along pretty well and give you a lot of in-depth stuff and information and footage from that time period, so you can really understand what's going on. So it's if it's you know, it's first-hand accounts and videos of a lot of that stuff. Not that all of it is, but a ton of it is. Now, war clouds. All right, J Japanese incursion into China. China clashed with Russia, all right, and, which made Japan, uh, Japan worry about its investments in China, namely a railway that went through Manchuria over here. And so what they did was they used the interference or the conflict between Russia and China as a reason to occupy China because they needed to control their investments. Now, China doesn't want Japan occupying it, and so they begin to ask the League in the United States for help. All right, uh, we refuse. Yet again, we're super isolationist, and <clears throat> the League of Nations doesn't get really all that uh, all that involved. But eventually, the League of Nations does kick Japan out uh, of its league, and they form an eventual truce. But what it does is it shows the militarism and animosity and all that sort of stuff that Japan has for basically conquering part of the you know eastern seaboard there of Asia. Um. And moving into this and moving forward, what you're going to see is how Japan is going to use uh, poison gas and all sorts of things against China. All right, And this is kind of really one of those forgotten parts of World War II, uh, what happened over here on in Asia. Now, Italy and Germany, yet again, take the time to watch those Walter Cronkite things. They're really, really good. Um, what was going on at the time was... While Japan was being militaristic and starting to dominate parts of, of Eastern Asia, uh, you had the rise of fascist dictators in Italy and Germany. All right? So Benito Mussolini seizes power in Italy um, and basically is going to bring about, um, well, he, he calls his like thing a, a whole new Roman Empire and all that sort of stuff, which is ironic because that's kind of what the, the Third Reich was calling itself too. But... <clears throat> This rise of fascism was kind of uh, kind of a common thing or an idea that was common at the time period. People were starting to lose faith in capitalism, right? Back to the whole Weimar Republic in Germany. Uh, the Germans traditionally are savers, you know, real pragmatic people. And so when their life savings during the Weimar Republic and this hyperinflation went to like zero, uh, they got pretty annoyed at it and they, they lost hope and, and all that sort of stuff. So they needed somebody to sort of give them hope to some extent, and, and Hitler is going to be one of these guys. Now, Hitler is going to be, you know, injured in World War One, all that sort of stuff, and, and his National Socialist Workers' Party, the Nazi Party, is going to come on the scene in the 1920s, and, it, and it's going to be famous at that point for Hitler trying to emulate Benito Mussolini's March on Rome, which is like his coup where he takes over, all that sort of stuff, um, with the Beer Hall Push, all right, and or coup, if you will, is going to be in Munich, and <clears throat> he's going to actually try to overthrow the government there, but they unite against him, they throw him in jail. Why he's in jail, he writes his famous Mein Kampf, and so forth and so on. Eventually, he gets out of jail, and he, he comes on the scene in the 30s, all right? And he's going to run for president eventually with this other political party, and so forth and so on. Not not trying to get too far off topic here, but the point I want to make is he never actually wins this election, all right? Political moves are going to make him the chancellor, all right? which is not quite the highest thing. There's a president above them. A lot of countries have chancellors and presidents or you know, chief executive and heads of state. They're two different things. Um, and he's going to be made chancellor. And eventually, uh, due to the fact that the anti-Nazi groups were too numerous, but yet again not powerful enough as one group to stand up to the Nazis, the Nazis basically sweep in and take power. All right, and then through the Enabling Act and a couple other things, uh, Hitler is going to basically make himself a dictator and rule over the government with one party. All right, and remember, you know, you might have heard of the SS, uh, which sounds like something in the uh, German army at the time. It was also uh, a military wing of the Nazi Party that had been used to fight other political parties. And when I mean fight, I mean like literally fight with with rifles and so forth, not like political fighting. Uh, so realize that the political movements at the time were a lot different than they are today. 
Hitler's uh, <clears throat> platforms and so forth, and actually a rising sentiment in Germany at the time was blaming the Jewish communities for their um, for their situation. All right, and so you're going to get the night of broken glass or whatever it is, where they go out and break all the Jewish uh, business owners' windows and stuff like that, and how they had to you know be corralled into to ghettos and so forth and so on. Uh, you've already been taught a lot of that stuff before. One of the other things is, is following the Treaty of Versailles, Germany had been basically demilitarized. They couldn't, they couldn't have a large army, and so Hitler's going to change that, and he's going to begin to rearm Germany, and he's going to put their industries in sort of full-on uh, preparedness mode for fighting. All right, and they're going to uh, begin to uh, become a bigger issue on the world stage. Right, and he's going to threaten to take control over all of the German-speaking peoples of Europe, which is uh, parts of Central and Eastern Europe where they speak German, like Austria and parts of uh, the Czech Republic and that part of uh, France that had been taken and parts of Poland and so forth. Now, at the same time, Russian re recognition. Realize the United States was not super fond of communist Russia, and so they had not recognized Russia or the Soviet Union as the rightful government of it. Okay, when I say recognize, it doesn't mean that the the you know president was looking at a map and just couldn't figure out which one was Russia. More so to the fact they didn't recognize politically the leadership of Russia. So if you had like two guys that were fighting to be the leaders of Russia and the one guy that you liked didn't win, you might not look at the other guy as being a legitimate leader. So that's what happened. But eventually FDR is going to recognize the Soviet Union in hopes of, yet again, making them a massive trading partner uh, with the United States, a place for um, good, our goods to go. All right? uh, they also had a common concern for Japan, so sort of the enemy of my enemy is my ally situation. All right, war clouds. The March of Aggression. Following 1932, events in Asia and Europe handle, uh, hurtled the world towards disaster, as your textbook puts it. In 1934, Japanese denounces that Five Powers Treaty that we talked about earlier and uh, invades China. Also, at the same time, Mussolini and Italy invade Ethiopia. Um, and <clears> at <throat> the same time, the Germans take back the Saar region. All right, The Saar region, as you can see, is this area. Uh, bordering bordering France, and begin to occupy the Rhineland. All right. Now the important thing about the Saar the Saar region was the coal mines. All right. Now you can see eventually that Hitler goes and begins to march all over the place and expand German influence. Now one of the interesting things during this time period is also the Spanish Civil War in 1936. Um, in Spain at the time. You had uh, nationalist groups and republican groups. Okay, republicans would have been the would have been people wanting a republican form of government, and then the nationalists wanting a more stringent sort of dictatorship, fascist that kind of thing. And General Franco will be the leader of the dictatorship that they're looking for. Now, what's interesting is, is since they have the same sort of ideology, the Nazis get on board with this and help Franco fight a civil war against the republicans in. Spain. Now, <clears throat> I left a map off of this, but I did include uh, some interesting pieces of art down here. You can see Pablo Picasso's famous Guernica right down here on the bottom right, uh, which memorializes the bombing of a village by the same name and the sort of horrors of, of war. Also, at the same time, you have Francisco Goya's, uh, don't remember the name of it off the top of my hand, but yet again, shows innocent people being shot and slaughtered uh, at the same time. Now, also, besides famous works of, uh, famous paintings, the same thing during this time period is, uh, guys like Ernest Hemingway, uh, traveled to Spain to report on the war, uh, because S Spain was near and dear to Hemingway's heart, and I want to say for whom the bell tolls comes from, uh, from this war, but I'm not, not exactly positive, you might want to double check that. Now, moving past this, uh, July 7th, 1937, uh, Japan and China are full-blown at war with one another. So World War II, even though we consider it sort of starting with the Nazis and so forth, actually starts two years earlier in, Euro in, in Asia than it does before the European theater gets going. All right? And the reason we say that is because uh, the Tripatriot Treaty is going to be signed between Japan, Germany, 
and uh, Italy forming the Rome-Berlin-Tokyo Axis, or eventually what we refer to as the Axis Powers. 1938, um, a rebuilt Germany is going to go on the offensive, all right? and Hitler is going to force Austria to join Germany. Yet again, German, Germanic peoples and speaking uh, German. Also, at the same time, European leaders are going to give in to his demands of in the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia, right, which Sudeten Germans were living in. Um, at the same time, a lot of this was reclaiming stuff that had been taken and, and uh, taken from Germany from the Treaty of Versailles. It was sort of a bloody nose for the Germans, and so Hitler is actually going to, uh, you know, I think he actually blows up the train car from it and all this sort of stuff, making big public displays. Okay, Hitler is going to begin to claim more and more places need to be under German control, all right? So he doesn't stop with the Sudetenland. Uh, instead, he goes on and takes the rest of the rest of Czechoslovakia and even, even parts of Lithuania, all right? He signs a non-aggression pact with Stalin and the USSR. That's a big important thing there because he doesn't want to have an Eastern Front, like, say, in World War I until the Russians and the then Soviet Union back out. Um, now, what's going to happen is the European powers aren't going to resist, all right? They don't want to go to war. Yet again, remembering how bad World War I was. So there's a sort of sense of appeasement during this time period. You'll, when you're watching the Seeds of War thing, you'll see Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of England, make his famous speech about peace in our time and that giving Chancellor Hitler what he needed was, you know, going to make sure we don't go to war kind of thing. Well, then what happens? Then the Blitz... And the Blitzkrieg occurs in Poland, and, and realizing now that this isn't going to go away and that nothing's going to stop them, this is going to drag Britain and France into the war. All right. Now, <clears throat> in the fighting in Poland is really kind of lopsided uh, when we talk about Blitzkrieg and stuff like that here in a, in a few slides. Realize that part of part of the Polish army was still using horses and cavalry and stuff like that, while Germany had become fully mechanized with, a, with, with tanks and an and, and, and air force and so forth. So parts of Poland just said, okay, you win, all right? Uh, if you ever go to Poland, I recommend visiting Krakow in the south, uh, because it was not bombed like Warsaw, and so you can still see some of the stuff. Now, degree of neutrality, all right? While the Europeans tried to appease these fascist dictators, the United States said, we don't want any of this, and we became more and more isolationist. There was a neutrality act, okay, that said we weren't going to loan money to any belligerents, and anybody that traveled on belligerent ships did so at their own risk, all right? And that was good initially, but then following the Spanish Civil, Civil War, FDR sought for a more, uh, stringent one and, and called for a moral embargo against civil wars as well, trying to get us uh, to not help out with that as well. In 1937, neutrality, this one, another neutrality act, forbade arms, but also didn't allow us to travel on other nations' ships, and we couldn't, we couldn't arm our merchant ships as well. Um, and what's going to happen is there was going to be a little bit of a, a loophole here, um, where we were going to trade on a cash and carry basis, meaning that if other places had wanted to trade with warring nations and we wanted to supply those weapons to them to then trade with them, so the good example in your textbook is China's fighting Japan, but if England isn't involved, we can trade with England and so forth and so on. But it had to be a cash and carry, so there's no credit. We couldn't loan it to them. Um, so the loophole, as it said, let U.S. ships uh, carry munitions to the U.K., so forth and Hong Kong. Okay, I already said that. Since FDR didn't want to stop uh, stop this, okay, he wasn't a true strict isolationist, okay, kind of like the neutrality thing in World War One, all right. Following the Nazi seizing of the Czech Republic, Poland, FDR uh, really can't sit back anymore. He realizes that we're going to have to get in this war on the side of these Western democracies, all right. Uh, that actually leads us to something important that I want to talk about. The idea of fascism, what fascism is, or where it starts actually, is in, in the this comes from the Roman time for fasces or fascists or whatever it is, the little uh, axe and sticks that the <clears throat> leaders of Rome would have carried with them to represent their power. So fascism really stems from the idea of the power of the state. Uh, now, in one of the classes I took, uh, it, it actually described fascism this. It's a term used to describe author authoritarian 
nationalist political ideologies or mass movements that are concerned with notions of culture decline or decadence. Um, culture of, of culture decline or decadence. Fascism seeks to achieve a millenarian national rebirth by placing the interests of the individual as subordinate to that of, an, of the nation or race and promoting cults of unity, energy, and purity. Uh, and as it goes on to say, it's easier to find what fascism isn't. Okay, Fascism is the polar opposite to the Western liberal ideal, which is what kind of we hold near and dear to our hearts as Americans. So the liberal ideal is we believe in elected government, the rule of law, uh, citizens' rights, we're informed by reason, and the perfectibility of humans, meaning we think that we're going to make the better world a better place through you know, human invention and human ideas and the, the, you know, the betterment of one another. While fascism is totalitarianism, meaning everybody has to line up and do the same thing, they use uh, racism instead of rationalism, and they use myth and superstition, and they all back it up with, with quote-unquote modern science. Okay, now, not that science is bad, but they try to use science to justify everything. And it tends to flourish in anti-democratic anti environments. So, the fascism during this time period was a result of, of people being concerned about where capitalism was going. So, in the 20s and 30s, fascism was seen as the happy medium between boom and bust prone liberal capitalism. So, what we were just talking about. Uh, with its alleged class conflict and wasteful competition and profit-oriented egoism, which is what the sort of downside people had to, capital, uh, to capitalism, and also at the same end, Marxism, with its violent, socially divisive persecution of the bourgeois, or the sort of upper class. Fascism substituted the particularly uh, of nationalism and, ra and racialism, right? Uh, meaning people were going to fight for their country, and it's going to be this homogeneous group. So, uh, blood and soil became a phrase for them, all right? Now, back to the, to the regular lecture here. So, following this, the seizing of Poland... France and Britain get involved, as I was saying, all right? But the interesting thing is, is back in the United States, FDR is going to try to get the ball rolling for us to get involved, which is, you know, yet again, away from the isolationist stuff that we talked about. And so, um, he couldn't get us to get involved initially because Congress was way, way down the isol isolationist road. He did, however, urge Americans not to be neutral in thought like, say, Woodrow Wilson did, which means take sides, pick Pick those side that's right. Pick the pick the the democratic Western side. Now, you know that some people did, you know, having German backgrounds, did actually side with with Germany in some of this stuff. Now, initially, people thought that the war would be like uh, World War One, all right, and that it would be this war of attrition, and that the Germans and the British and the French would grind to a halt, and it would be, you know, who had more resources. And most people assumed that Great Britain and France had more stuff or more resources since the Treaty of Versailles had sort of crippled Germany, all right? And that, in the end, they would outlast them. So we didn't have to get involved. All right, the storm in Europe, all right? In the spring of 1940, Germany unleashed the Blitzkrieg, all right? April 9th at dawn, the Nazis began to occupy Denmark and landed troops along the Norwegian coast. In May 10th, they began bombing the Belgium and Belgium and, and the Netherlands. All right now, Blitzkrieg was a new idea for war. All right, think about World War One. It was static. There were um, trenches dug, and people thought they were going to sort of face off against each other from their trenches. All right, even even out of that, France created the Maginot Line, which you can see right here is this dark red line. And the Maginot Line, as you can see, is just uh, directly was directly designed to keep the Germans out, all right? And you can see it had bunkers and, and turrets and gun emplacements, and it was a very formidable static uh, line, which means it wasn't going to move, right? So the Germans said, that's nice and all, we're just going to go through Belgium. Much like the Schlieffen plan from World War I, we're not going to worry about what's, what's right there, we're just going to go around it, all right? And since they didn't want to get bogged down, and then since they had new technology like aircraft and tanks and fast-moving vehicles... That was going to be the idea for the Blitzkrieg, all right? One of the big proponents of the Blitzkrieg was a guy by the name of Heinz Guderian. And Heinz Guderian was a tank commander. And in his book, Panzer Leader, he wrote, In this year, 1929, I became convinced that tanks working on their own in conjunction with infantry could never achieve decisive importance. My historical studies, the exercise carried out in England and our own experience with mock-ups had persuaded me that the tanks would never be able to produce their full effect 
until the other weapons of those who support them must never really rely were, were brought up to the standard of speed and of cross-country performance. In such formation of all arms, the tank must play the primary role. The other weapons being subordinate of the requirements of the armor, it would be wrong to include tanks and in infantry divisions that was needed were armored divisions which would which would include all the sporting arms needed to allow the tanks to fight with, with full effect. Short version, tanks needed to be fast, everything around them needed to be fast, and we need to move. All right? And the Panzer was designed for that, and it was going to roll up parts of France pretty quickly. All right? So the idea was the Panzer with an infantry unit would be able to roll past the enemy, get behind them, um, also uh, begin to control large, peri large pieces of land quickly, right? so that the war didn't slow down. Also, two other things that were created during this time period, or, or more effectively used during this time period, were aircraft. The Luftwaffe and their dive bombing um, <clears throat> became very, very important. The actual bombings of places uh, becomes a big, important move. Also, the use of paratroopers are, is going to be seen during this time period as well. And it's all about being fast and light and getting and achieving your goal before uh, the enemy can really counterattack or you know, be aware that the attack is occurring. Now, following the bombing of the Netherlands, Germany was going to cut off French and English attempts to, uh, to resupply or, or aid the people in Belgium and Holland. So you can see right here, the first part is they sweep sort of right to left across the map and pin, pin the French and some English uh, right here against the channel. Now, there's going to be two famous battles at Calais and Dunkirk where it's sort of this last-ditch effort to hold on, and that's what's going to be right here. As you can see, the German forces are going to attack Calais and Dunkirk um, and then also turn south to the Seine River right here, which is, runs through Paris. All right, So it was swing right to left and then turn south, and you can see how then right here it is to... The goal is to take over Paris. So these three... Uh, maps show the movements of Germany right there. Now, at Calais and Dunkirk, at Calais, they're going to hold off and actually cause some of the troops that would have gone to Dunkirk um, to move south to Calais to, to finish off the French and English there. And then while at Dunkirk, there's going to be this operation called Operation Dynamo, which is basically um, from Dover, which is right across the channel, right over here, or I guess better right here uh, in this map, where they were trying to evacuate people and every seagoing vessel in England was called upon to try to go and help the people uh, and the troops evacuate from Dunkirk. At the same time period, everybody's favorite Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, is going to be, uh, not elected, but made the Prime Minister of England during this time period. And, and Churchill uh, is going to be uh, rousingly entertaining, but also um, really the right guy for the job, following Neville, Neville Chamberlain and... Um, his appeasement, Churchill's 180. He's a he's a wartime prime minister, and most people don't. Most people assume that he wasn't actually the first guy for the job. Uh, Lord Halifax was also thought to be of asked to be the uh, prime minister, but turned it down. Uh, some people thought that he might have actually tried to make a deal with the Nazis so that they just wouldn't invade wouldn't invade England. Now, if you're interested in Churchill, there's a really good set of books called uh, Churchill's Hour, Churchill's Triumph, and uh, Never Surrender, which are all by Michael Dobbs. And I'll, I'll include a link to those on the website. Now, America's growing involvement. Uh, Britain stood alone, uh, and Winston Churchill oozed defiance. Um, famously, you know, as they bombed England, he would stand on top of his, his office to watch. Um, and basically uh, called for FDR to help, help the Allies and help England. All right? So FDR, at the same time, had been calling for a military buildup and sort of mobilizing us for war. Uh, FDR, who had before been mired in neutrality, was now invigorated to help the British, and even actually had a secret uh, agreement to uh, trade overage destroyers, not necessarily overage, but the idea was to help um, protect uh, trade ships or whatever in the Channel and around England from uh, German and, or Nazi wolf packs or, or submarines. Um, and this will foreshadow the Lynn-Lease Agreement because basically the deal was it'll allow us to have 
extended leases in British-held ports and stuff like that for naval bases. Um, September 14th, 1940, the first peacetime conscription. Um, all 16 million men in the United States, ages 25 to 35, are regist- required to register, register for the draft, and be called upon to serve their country. Now, FDR's third term, uh, FDR being a Democrat, uh, had to face Republican opposition. The Rub- Republicans were isolationists, even though their, their main candidate, Wendell Wilkie, was not. Um, the Nazi victories made FDR... Uh, feel compelled to run again, but as your textbook puts it, he was a sphinx, he had a sphinx-like silence about his intentions, right? So it was pretty obvious that FDR was pro-involvement um, while the Republicans were, were anti-involvement. Uh, and also, FDR is going to run with a new vice president, Henry Wallace, to get the farm vote. And <clears throat> moving along with, with FDR's ideas here, the idea of the arsenal of democracy. Uh, FDR had to be inventive to get around the direct loans uh, the direct loan deals and all that sort of stuff, especially the Johnson Loan Act and so forth. And so in his fire, one of his fireside chats, he refers to the great arsenal of democracy and, and how we need to help our Democratic brothers, all right, and the need for the Lend-Lease Bill to be passed. Um, Britain and China, once the Lend-Lease Bill is passed, will be the first beneficiaries, meaning, yet again, we get to have port naval bases in places like China and so forth, and we will then help them uh, fight their fight their wars and help them with the war effort monetarily. All right, uh, the Axis powers begin to move into places such as Greece and North Africa. One of the big things is that they want to cut off the Suez Canal for in- for the English oil and so forth. Um, <clears throat> Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria are also going to be forced into the Nazi fold. And then in June twenty second, nineteen forty forty one, uh, Hitler makes one of the bigger mistakes of the war. He then turns east and attacks the Soviet Union. He tries to use Blitzkrieg uh, in this as well. The problem is that the Soviet Union is so large. And so he does take big swaths of land in the Soviet Union, but once winter sets in, in places such as Leningrad, Moscow, and Sevastopol, uh, the soldiers and citizens are going to fight back and uh, eventually counterattack against the Nazis. And, and eventually, I imagine next chapter, it'll talk about the Battle of Stalingrad which is pretty famous in this theater of war. Um, all of this, though, even though the, there was a counterattack in those places, the Nazis looked sort of unstoppable. They looked like they were just going to roll across Europe. And that was actually, you know, even though we know how the war turned out, that was actually a real possibility at this point. And so Churchill and FDR give aid to Russia, um, and, namely because if the Germans are worried about fighting the Russians on the Eastern Front, uh, that will give give Britain uh, more time to prepare, and also the Germans will use more of their resources fighting in the east. Um, Wolf packs, the submarine groups, will roam the North Atlantic, even some of them making it off the coast of the United States. Uh, More and more, the U.S. was moving towards all-out naval warfare against the Germans, even though we weren't officially at war with them. And the Storm of the Pacific... Um, Japan had what they would refer to as the Greater East Asia uh, Co-Prosperity Sphere. Um, Basically, this idea that all these Asian countries would supply resources to Japan uh, that they couldn't produce themselves. And in that, Japan depended upon 80% uh, or 80% of Japan's oil imports were from the United States. So we were really the lifeblood for their manufacturing and, and industrialization. July 1941, Japan announced it was creating a protectorate over all of French Indochina. Indochina being bent down here. Uh, today we refer to it as Vietnam. And then this aggressive move uh, caused FDR to freeze all of the Japanese um, assets in the United States and restrict oil exports to Japan. All right? At the same time, he put General Douglas MacArthur in charge of the U.S. and Philippine, Filipino troops in the Far East. Um... Once trying to get to the bargaining table with Japan over uh, French Indochina, it was it was just too difficult to negotiate a peace. All right, um, we couldn't they couldn't meet common ground. Uh, there were numerous chances to avoid uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Not necessarily that we knew it was going to happen, but uh, the two sides couldn't get past fundamental issues of you know Japan occupying a French held colony. 
Um, Hideki Tojo, the prime, uh, the former war minister, now is going to be the prime minister of Japan yet again, moving Japan into a more militaristic role. Um, and Japan began to move troops uh, around the Pacific. All right, and so uh, mostly people thought they were going to maybe attack the Philippines or the British, British and Dutch colonies, um, because Pearl Harbor seemed too far away for them to move their troops. So as aircraft carriers and troop and stuff like that began to move. The U.S. had knowledge of it. They just didn't figure it was going to Pearl Harbor. They assumed it was going to other places. Um, and so December 7th, 1941, the Japanese are going to sail two aircraft carriers off the coast of Oahu in Japan, or excuse me, in Hawaii, and bomb Pearl Harbor. Now, what would happen is there would be two aircraft carriers, if there was a full map of the island, up on the northern edges. And one would fly through the valley, uh, through central uh, central Oahu, from the northern end attacking Pearl Harbor, while the other would fly around and come up from the south attacking Pearl Harbor. Now you'll see here, off of Ford Island, how all of the uh, battleships were in a row. Okay, The idea was that that would make them uh, easier to defend against, uh, not necessarily from bombs from the sky, though. And the reason why was they thought that the harbor was too shallow, right, for torpedoes or anything like that, so it was just easier to defend them if they were all clumped together. They didn't suspect the Japanese were going to bomb them, and so once um, once they began to bomb Pearl Harbor, it was really, uh, you know, ducks, ducks on a pond or fish in a barrel, whatever kind of analogy you want to use there, because you can see just all the military material just was in such close proximity to one another. Now, it's going to fall short of a total success. They're going to ignore the fuel tankers here and here. And also, um, the aircraft carriers had been out of port at the time, which, uh, which they were out at sea, and so they weren't harmed. And they will be, play a huge role later on in the war, the Battle of Midway and so forth. Um, there were roughly, I want to say, 2,400 people died at Pearl Harbor, and there were another 1,200 that were injured. Um, and it becomes the... the rallying cry for the United States. Um, later that day, the Japanese invaded the Philippines, Guam, uh, Midway Island, and Hong Kong, and the Malay Peninsula. Now, once the news reaches the United States, uh, FDR sits down and has his famous A uh, Day That Will Live in Infamy speech, uh, how we were attacked by Japan, and this will bring the United States into World War II.